Hello there friends, this is Dota News, we are here to create the best Dota News channel ever, here's what we cover in today's episode. Gorg thrashes Nightfall, Over Plus will obliterate Dota, Boxy causes a scandal at a tournament, Ami is no longer considered a genius and much more. Without further ado, let's get straight to it. But guys, hey, before we dive into the video, I need to share something important with you. Dear viewers, I genuinely enjoy creating Dota content for you, but I've been encountered with some serious financial challenges recently. If I can't find a sponsor by the end of February, I may have no choice but to shut down the channel. If any of you are willing to support the production of new videos, or if you own a business that could benefit from some advertising, please reach out to me at Dota News White at gmail.com. Alternatively, if you wouldn't mind supporting me on Patreon, let me know in the comments below. If there's enough interest, I'll set up a Patreon account. Once again, guys, I read all your comments. Thank you so much for your attention and support. It really means a lot to me. And now, let's get to news. Let's kick off our video today with a story about everyone's favorite streamer, Gorg, once again expressing his frustrations with Nightfall, particularly regarding his smurfing. Gorg didn't hold back in his criticism, wishing Valve had the courage to ban the esports athlete. It's worth noting that the player has already received warnings from Valve, but continues to play on smurf accounts. This ongoing conflict between smurfs, Gorg and Nightfall has been simmering for a while now, with Valve yet to take decisive action. Now, let's delve into the probably most hotly debated topic in Dota right now, the bans related to Overplus. You see, friends, Dota's online player count dropped by about 25,000 people in just one day, largely due to these bans. As we mentioned in our previous video, many of those banned are streamers and high-level players. For example, the top player of the Chinese ladder received a VAC ban for using Overplus. It's also important to remember that receiving a VAC ban locks you out from the community market and trading, resulting in thousands of extremely valuable skins being lost forever. On one hand, this wave of bans is beneficial for the community, eliminating malicious players and showing that Valve is monitoring the game and striving to improve it. However, on the other hand, it's tough to label the use of Overplus as cheating, which makes it hard not to feel sympathy for those of some affected users. Guys, what do you think about this whole Overplus situation? Write your thoughts in the comments below. But it's not just Valve that's deeply concerned about the situation. The creators of Overplus have issued a lengthy statement to Valve, essentially declaring war on Gabe Newell. Following the ban of their users, the Overplus team announced that from now on their skin changer would be visible in matches, allowing all users to see the skins you've equipped, as well as still being able to see the enemy's top heroes, you know, to counterpick them or just ban. But why could this threat be serious for Valve? The answer is simple. The Dota 2 items are quite expensive sometimes, and some of them are even unavailable at all, while a monthly subscription to Overplus costs just pennies. Consequently, the revenue Valve generates from treasure openings, the marketplace commission and the Steam game purchases could decrease, as all users might prefer to pay less for the same benefits. Usually, Valve doesn't take kindly to their profits being diverted elsewhere. On one hand, this could pose a threat to Valve as they might lose a portion of their income, on the other on the other hand, declaring war on a company like Valve seems almost insane, to be honest. I mean, do even Overplus developers know that Valve has an army of lawyers? Anyways, it will be interesting to see what the outcome will be and how the company and the community will respond to such statements. To stay updated on all the developments, make sure to subscribe to our channel, hit the like button and don't forget also about the notification bell. And more on the topic of updates, it's also worth mentioning the treasure. Yes, we've already mentioned this in our previous video. However, we unfortunately forgot to share an interesting fact about the main reward. So basically, this reward, this ancient skin with the dragon, will only be available in the year of the dragon, which is this year and the next time it's 2036. Yes, that's right, 2036. So if you didn't get it or buy it yet, you might want to hurry, otherwise you'll be waiting for another 12 years. 
Speaking of celebrations, it's impossible not to mention the wonderful Dota tournament known as BB Dacia, where a 1v1 tournament took place, won by Nisha, who defeated XM in the finals. Throughout the tournament he played against ATF, Malrin, Squadex and GPK. In the finals he played as Mirana, Shadowfiend, Marcy and Meepo. And by winning it, he earned $50,000. According to Nisha, he won't be giving all the money away, but he might share a bit with his team, as they were, quote, a big help to him. Additionally, he mentioned that he would definitely be spending part of the money on skins for CS2 or Valorant. Hey, just wait, does it mean that we can lose one of the best mid laners in the world to CS2 or Valorant? Anyways, it will be interesting to see which team Nisha decides to join. I guess it might be Team Liquid, because they also have a CS2 team. And what role he will choose, like the sniper or the rifler or whatever. Anyways, it's all just banter. But guys, what tournament can go smoothly and have no scandals? Correct, if it's a Dota tournament, then none. Obviously, this time was no exception. The tournament had a rule that wards could not be destroyed because they grant gold and experience. I mean the 1v1 tournament. And during a match between Boxy and Save, the Team Liquid player placed a sentry ward that revealed Save's Observer ward. Boxy himself didn't touch the ward, but the creeps destroyed it, and Boxy received received additional gold and experience. And obviously, opinions were divided, some demanded a technical defeat for Boxy, arguing that he had indirectly violated the rules, while others claimed that he hadn't broken any rules, since he didn't directly interact with the ward. Ultimately, the judges decided to continue the match, ruling that Boxy hadn't technically broken any rules, but they promised to pay closer attention to such incidents in the future, which didn't occur further. Guys, what do you think? Should Boxy have been given a technical loss or did he play within the rules? Write your thoughts in the comments below. And some more news from BB Dacha. Ori, you know him, the Chinese player, compiled a tier list of the best mid laners, and surprisingly, he placed all the players in the S tier, with the exception of PYW and DY. Wait a minute, what are they doing here again? If my memory serves me right, both players are supports, not mid laners. So, how did they end up on the tier list? Hopefully, this was just a light hearted trolling by the organizers and Ori, rather than an insult to the players. As for the tier list itself, there is room for debate, as some players perform much better than others, for example Armel or Setsu. But regardless, the level of play is very high and the player's achievements should not be discounted under any circumstances. And since we're talking about mid laners, there's something more. Now it's about Malren, the Falcon's mid laner. He provided some insights on a variety of significant topics. For instance, he shared what he will do if he wins the international. He says that he will still be a regular Dota 2 player, even if he wins TI. In his view, there is no point on putting oneself on a pedestal, and one should always prepare for the worst and hope for the best. He also discussed the, the hype surrounding Ame, stating that the excitement will be warranted it only if Ami secures a victory at Bibi Dacha. And towards the interview's end, Malrin did something many eagerly awaited. Just take a look at this. Yeah, I have a really important question over here. I'm just going to delay you guys sitting down. Can you meow into the microphone for me, Malrin? Meow. <laughs> Can you meow longingly as if you had a twin and you just discovered them and met them for the first time? Meow. Is this normal <laughs> behavior good. for him? That's good. This you guys is a typical take... day in our practice room. You guys can take your right, yeah, you guys can, I feel like that definitely deserves... And on that note, let's move on to the matches. First, let's discuss Falcons vs Extreme Gaming. Why do every game Falcons get their strong heroes again? Skeeter on Naga, ATF on Timberso, and even their mid, Malrin gets Spango. It seems like the Chinese teams haven't prepared for the drafts at all, or maybe they're just that confident in their skills. But in the lanes, something clearly went wrong for the Radiant Cores. All of Dyer's were just gigantic. The only player carrying Extreme Gaming on his broad shoulders was Sinky. I don't know where he finds all this farm, but this guy definitely doesn't struggle with gold, even in such a tough game. I feel sorry for Extreme Gaming's carry, struggling the whole game and getting sniped constantly. Just imagine playing a game where you could be killed in one second. That's a game Ame is playing. Seeing a lackluster performance from the top seed of the group is certainly surprising. Personally, I expected the Chinese teams to give their opponents a thorough beating, but it turned out that they gave Ame a hard time instead. 
instead. Falcons decided to farm into the late game until Skeeter was 10k gold ahead of Slark. And with such an advantage, Falcon Scary decided to breach the opponent's high ground. But against that Zeus with Manta in short, good luck getting through, not to mention Primal Beast being impenetrable with BKB. So Dyer had to wait for the third Roshan, with it they could surely finish. Divine purchases, when it really mattered, it was the game. They're in! Whoa! Oh my god! He's just dead? Immediately dead! Life drain on the nether war, but it's not gonna really do much for them. DY's gonna decrepify themselves. They got some damage on Amar, but the song is there to reset it all. They're gonna heal. They've got the shard onto the Naga Siren. So look at all these heroes at full health for the side of Falcons. This looks like the final fight. They get the gun to Zinku as well as DY. This is XM with the BKB right clicking away. They've got the pulverize out of Skinner, but it's looking like it might be enough damage to finally get the kill on the Naga Siren. He's going down. He's dead. They bought back on the Crystal Maiden. They've got the Rolling Thunder. That's gonna put XM up in the air with that axe. He's shield crashing, doing some bad damage with the Swatch Buckle. They take out XM. Triple kill here for Amar. Pounce leashing. That lands on a crit life drain coming out from DY. Rolling Thunder still going for a second longer. Nightmare's gonna be reflected with the Lotus Orb. Snake King's here. They've got the Nether Blast and the Life Drain coming up from DY. Mage Slayer holding them back a little bit. Uh oh, with the BKB. in trouble. Around. Ame's gonna be back into this one with the Fiend's Grip. Ono Amar with an average coming in. The Life Drain's not gonna be enough to save Ame. He doesn't have buyback. He's dead for 108 seconds. Uh, Amar's gonna go in for the rest. DY is dead. Triple kill again. Everybody gone on the side of Extreme. Falcon. And at that Roshan, ATF and his bros just demolished the Chinese team, taking down eight heroes from Extreme Gaming. And they had no buybacks, so it was much easier and faster just to go and make the Mega Creeps. And that's exactly what Dyer did. And there it is, the long-awaited last fight. Thing doing. These creeps being cleaned up very quickly. The blink right on top of DY. They get the kill there onto this Pugna as well as the Bane. So there's no supports to help him out. Amar's going to be left with a fourth of his health. They go to the Pulverize. They get the kill. So he's going to be dead. That's going to be Aegis coming back into the fight. But they've got the song. So they'll reset the three quarters of Extreme Gaming against XM. the entire side of Falcons. They're going to go for XM. They've got the double chakra. That's on everybody. So they'll look over at Ami. That's going to be Yules up into the air. XM, XXS trying to survive. But there's the uproar activation with the Rolling Thunder. That's going to bounce up Ami. They get the kill on XXS. It's the Two heroes left he on the side of Extreme. Buy. They get the kill on Ame. They look over at XM. Everybody dead. And that's going to be... Seems like Ame and the guys haven't woken up yet. But maybe they'll pull themselves together for the next map. But it seems that they didn't. Especially Extreme's mid laner. The draft for Dyer was clearly stronger. And it seemed like the Chinese players had won their lanes. But then Mr. Malrin, who had completely outplayed his opponent in mid, decided to assist his teammates by roaming to every lane. Skeeter didn't particularly benefit from this support, but the Falcons offlaner ATF managed to farm the necessary Yules for the team. Basically, it was really important for him to build this item. By the way, I recommend you to try this build against mobile heroes. I personally found it more effective than a physical build. The main focus of aggression this game was XM. From the get-go, the mid laner was having a rough time, constantly finding himself in tricky situations. Yet, even with their team slightly behind, Ami was having a great game, engaging in excellent fights and securing the first Roshan. Interestingly, while Extreme Gaming were taking down Roshan, Falcons caught a Wandering Storm Spirit and took him out. And then they also got Techies. I really like how ATF decided not to go with the usual build for his Mars, but instead he opted for a Yules and a Blink Dagger. This not only provided an escape from Juggernaut's ultimate, but also made it easier to catch Storm Spirit, a tactic Malrin and his teammates made good use of. Dyer had no choice but to mirror their opponents. Falcons made it to the high ground? That means we can too! Let's go, guys! But the only thing they didn't consider was that Radiant were just buying time for Skitter, while his teammates were fiercely battling with extreme gaming to life and death, he just tore down the barracks of the Chinese team. At the 40-minute mark, Ame made his first critical mistake and died. Honestly, guys, I would have lost it too, seeing how my mid laner was playing. But he didn't stay down for long, he had to buy back and go take Roshan. However, Falcons calmly waited out the Aegis and cunningly encircled Extreme Gaming at their base. Once the Aegis expired, they effortlessly entered high ground and took the last lane. Guys, here's a little note, the lags were on the broadcast itself, not in the video. Unfortunately, there's nothing I can do about that. And then ATF was just messing with his opponents, having fun. I felt like this game was some kind of a Tundra gameplay from the victorious international run. It was very suffocating, I really struggled to watch this match.
Next off to Spirit vs Gaming Gladiators. And the first map started off evenly here, Yarrow throws the game on his lane, while Anton in his own signature style catches a smoke gang in another lane. However, the exchanges in fights are in the Gladiators' favor. The dragons just can't seem to pull off any significant streaks with their heroes. Just look at Celery here, he completely tears all the plans of Team Spirit apart. We slow to a crawl, thanks to the sticky bomb. And a jump in from Laurel, gets the Dragon Tail, there's the blast off onto two, Soulbind as well, but the BKB is popped from Drachio, takes out one Double quickly, roar. that is just the techies, it's the Black nice Bolt black onto hole. two, and Quinn rolling on deep with that Aghanim Scepter shield crash doing so much damage, they get three, make it four, Ace with the triple kill, only member left is Yatoro, and there's no way he can contest this Roche now. After such a disheartening fight, the dragons couldn't make a comeback. They lost a side, decided to take a terribly bad fight, and indeed with such gameplay GG are not to be defeated. Quinn and the boys went full throttle and knocked Spirit out. Now they're just one map away from pulling off a sensation. In the second game the dragons surprised us with a conquer for collapse. Usually we see this hero played by Laurel, it seems like Team Spirit had a secret strategy up their sleeve for this one. However, secret strategies didn't help much in the lanes, where GG just outplayed Spirit this time around. But in teamfights, the dragons still excelled, and a single mistake could cost a lot. Laurel secured a nice triple kill for himself, and the game started to pick up pace. Surprisingly, Duraccio wasn't caught as often in this game, it's unclear whether he's just reading the opponents really well, or he's been incredibly lucky. Are arriving, a little too quick. Duraccio does not care, wants to get that- oh my god. All right, absolutely deletes Mira, but yeah. the X into the boat coming. Not a whole lot of mana for collapse, though. They need to run. There's Laurel uh. RP'd into the arms of Duraccio. Sonic Wave comes out, though, but the Chronosphere right on top of him. Yatoro can't hit him because of the ult. The Shadow Dance is doing work here, and now the Black Hole onto Yatoro, and they killed the Quap as well. Disaster strikes for Team Spirit. Maposhka looks to be next on the list. It'll eventually come, surely. And this seems like the moment when GG's carry really started to solo carry the game for his team. He baited out all the key abilities from the enemy heroes, stayed alive and also dealt significant damage. Turns out Duraccio was just getting warmed up with his aggressive battle tactic. Just look at how Duraccio played the role of a scout and pulled off another flight win for his team. HP. They need yeah. a very crisp fight, but the Rachio is on the mission of yeah, breaking. Duraccio. Gets off the Dark Pact. Initiation now onto Kunkka. Well, actually, Shadow Dance already. Oh, there's the Harpoon Ooh, Skewer hex. into a pounce. Laurel is the recipient. Gets what? off the Sonic the Wave, damage. but he dies shortly after. Now the BKB popped by Duraccio. Focusing on Kunkka now. Collapse. Gets off a nice Torrent Storm as Ace. Finds his way out of the Serpent Wards. Tidal Wave comes out as well, but the Shield Crash from Quinn Keeping heroes busy. Already two cores dead for Spirit, though, which means they are going to have to back away. Not That's one support dead. down now as this fight has... Ace put a decisive end to this map with his Rampage, sending Team Spirit to the lower bracket. And by the way, this was the first Rampage at BB Dacha. And just like that, Gaming Gladiators pulled off an upset at this tournament, breaking Team Spirit's massive undefeated streak. And so, after this match, Team Spirit's impressive 35 game winning streak has come to an end. All the players acknowledged making numerous mistakes and admitted that GG were just stronger today. We're hoping that the Dragons will soon set a new record and make history once again. But even as the Dragons' Dota win streak has come to an end, they've pulled off a real sensation in CS2. Yes, that's right, CS2. Team Spirit won the IEM Katowice 2024, sweeping Face Clan with a 3-0 victory in the finals. The tournament's MVP award went to the team's youngest player, Dong, who is just 17 years old. So congratulations to Team Spirit on such an achievement, and we hope they continue to deliver strong performances across all esports disciplines. And as always, let's wrap up with the best moments. We'll kick things off with a rampage from Ace. X to start things out, Orchid onto Yatoro. Well, they actually might have found the connection, but Cold Drop. Embrace now. A lot of this damage is mitigated, but there's a Chrono, but the cursed. instant curse on top of the Void. It's gonna mitigate all of this, and Celery gets a nice black hole. Yatoro will be the first to fall there, along with Laurel. Ultra kill for Ace. 
And that'll be GG's called Collapse, the last remaining member. They're trying to give the Rampage to Ace. Next is the battle for Roshan between Falcons and Extreme Gaming. Find purchases when it really matter. It was the game. They're in. Whoa, Ami, God. He's just dead. Immediately dead. Life drain on the Nether War, but it's not going to really do much for them. DY is going to decrepify themselves. They got some damage on Amar, but the song is there to reset it all. They're going to heal. They've got the shard onto the Naga Siren. So look at all these heroes at full health for the side of Falcons. This looks like the final fight. They get the gun to Zinq as well as DY. This is XM with the BKB right clicking away. They've got the pulverize out of Skinner, but it's looking like it might be enough damage to finally get the kill on the Naga Siren. He's going down. He's dead. They bought back on the Crystal Maiden. They've got the Rolling Thunder. That's going to put XM up in the air with that axe. He's shield crashing, doing some bad damage with the Swat Struggle. They take out XM. Triple kill here for Amar. Pounce leashing. That lands on a crit. Life drain coming out from DY. Rolling Thunder still going for a second longer. Nightmare's going to be reflected with a Lotus Orb. Snake King's here. They've got the Nether Blast and the Life Drain coming out from DY. Mage Slayer holding them back a little bit. Uh oh, with the BKB. Ame's in Turning trouble. Around. Ame's going to be back into this one with the Fiend's Grip. Ano Amar with the damage coming in. The Life Drain's not going to be enough to save Ame. He doesn't have buyback. He's there for 108 seconds. Amar's going to go in for the rest. DY is dead. Triple kill again. Everybody got on the side of Extreme. Falcons coming. And finally, a showdown for the high ground between Azure Ray and Team Liquid. Whoa, whoa, whoa. They're going to jump him. He is dead immediately. They might be looking to put some ultimate pressure in here because they glyphed. This Ori's bottom stuck. tier three is a, a big problem. Boxy, he's going to get up into the trees. He's got the spirit vessel on him. Earth good spike bubble. lands. They're draining, but Ori's dead. He's got buyback below. He needs to get out now. The damage is just so overwhelming. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, they're mana draining. They get Insania. They'll take out Boxy. They lose Box. So everybody is just kind of dropped uh, in this situation. Is not at, moving. Is 100 moves. And that's all for today, friends. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to leave your feedback in the comments below, because it's really important for me to improve by listening to you guys. Also, hit that subscribe button to follow the best Dota 2 news channel. I'm not saying goodbye for a long time. See you soon.